great British explorer, George Mallory, was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. Every day, every year, thousands of square miles of tropical forest are cleared. Um, it's roughly about the size of Massachusetts. It varies year to year. I work in the Amazon, in the jungle, um, in Peru, Ecuador, and Brazil, and I've seen a lot of different things, um, some amazing things. But there's nothing like seeing a deforested landscape. It really gives you um, a, a sick feeling to your stomach. It's kind of like when I see my daughter sick and I, and I can't really do anything about it. I just watch her get sicker and sicker. Fortunately, just like my daughter, um, if you can remove those causes of deforestation, like stopping logging, stopping um, agricultural expansion, and you allow land to go back to fallow, the land will, will heal. The forest will regrow, plants will return, animals will come back, um, and you can almost get the forest to the natural state that it was before you cleared the land. Now, this is true of a lot of activities, a lot of deforestation activities that I've seen. The problem is about eight years ago, April 2011, I actually came across an activity that, that really does not allow the forest to regenerate. It causes permanent destruction. And then, in fact, when I first saw it, I, I really wasn't sure what I was looking at. It, it kind of looked like a logging company on steroids or some kind of strange desert biome in the middle of the jungle that I had never read about. But unfortunately, it was told to me that this is gold mining. And, and since that time, I've actually, I, I'm not a toxicologist, but I started studying gold mining um, pretty intensely. And I visited a lot of sites, and pretty much it looks the exact same. It's a barren landscape, completely devoid of plant life. And, and one of the, the biggest problems is, is the fact that as miners go and do this deforestation, uh, they dig down so deep into the ground, sometimes 30 or 40 feet deep, and they cause such an upheaval of the soil that the, the, the ground will never regenerate plant life. And if you live in California, you can just drive up to Sacramento and you can see the Yuba River, and you can see a 150-year legacy of gold mining there. It is completely devoid of plants. It's really sad to see. And after studying several different forms of environmental change, I've, I've come to this conclusion that gold mining is one of the biggest threats to sustainable development that we have worldwide, and it's one of the biggest threats to human health that we have. And a lot of people say, hey, come on, this is just an alarmist talking. Um, it can't possibly be real. You know, this is gold mining. But le let me just show you a couple things. So I'm sure people have seen signs like this. This is a one sign in California, one in Massachusetts. They exist all over the United States. They exist a lot in other countries. But it's warning you about fish consumption of certain species because of mercury contamination. Now, you might be wondering, how does mercury end up into our fish and on our plate? Well, that's a simple process. You might want to know that, and you might not be aware, that gold mining, and specifically artisanal and small-scale gold mining, which is the type of gold mining that exists in the Amazon, is the number one cause of mercury pollution to the environment worldwide, and that's uh, studies by the United Nations Environment Program. It surpasses all fossil fuel burning, production of other metals, smelting, cremation, everything. It's number one. And the mercury that we find in our fish, a lot of it comes from gold mining because once it enters the atmosphere, it can travel several thousand miles. And, and why exactly does this happen with artisanal gold mining? So the process of artisanal gold mining is very rudimentary. So it's supposed to be non-mechanized, but it really ends up to the fact that gold doesn't exist as nuggets or seams in rock anymore. It, it really exists in the environment as flakes of dust usually in river sediment or in, in dirt. And so what the miners do, they simply excavate an area. They put the excavation into a slurry pit or a container. And if you've taken chemistry class, you might know that mercury exists as a liquid at room temperature. And if you take mercury and you pour it on top of gold, or if you take gold and you sprinkle on top of mercury, it actually dissolves. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and take your sisters, your parents, or some piece of gold, break an open old, old thermometer and pour it on there and you'll see it dissolve and then run away <laughs> because you don't want to be there. But when that mercury uh, combines with gold, it actually forms a little alloy called an amalgam. It's basically a gold mercury rock. And so in that slurry pit, the rock falls to the bottom, the miner takes it out and burns that amalgam off, 
the mercury vaporizes and what you're left with is pure gold. That's the kind of a gold purification process, right? That amount of mercury pollution is one of, it is the leading cause of mercury pollution in the atmosphere. But you'll note from this process, there's another big cause of mercury pollution, and that's that slurry pit. So if you walk around gold mining areas, you'll see little ponds of toxic sludge, and that's kind of the leftover mercury that's there. And all of the mercury ends up into watersheds. If you've ever seen the movie Nemo, all, all ponds end up going to the ocean, right? But in an aquatic environment, there's something called biogeochemical cycling, where the, that elemental mercury that deposited, whether locally or a 1,000 miles away, transforms elemental mercury into methylmercury. Methylmercury is extremely toxic. It is consumed by small microorganisms and bioaccumulates up the food chain and ends up on our plate when we want to eat it. Methylmercury is not a fast killer. It's not like an infectious disease. It doesn't happen like this but it's something that slowly and permanently impairs your central nervous system, your kidneys, your heart, and your immune response, among other organs that are, exist in your body. So I'm told you, I'm had, adding weight to you today. So the question is, you know, what, what can we really do about this? Why, why is it a big effect on sustainable development? But that has to do with kind of the other big impact of mercury in gold mining. Not only does it cause forced destruction, cause massive mercury contamination. But the stakeholders involved in producing and consuming gold play a big role in the process. So what I mean by stakeholders, I mean people who have an indirect or, indirect or direct benefit from the production or consumption of gold. And the, there's a lots of stakeholders, but probably the two most important are the miners themselves. Okay, so in the Amazon, uh, primarily, and, and this is true in other tropical environments as well, most of the people doing the mining are coming from poor areas, and most of the mining that exists is illegal. So in Peru, for example, where I work primarily, 95% of the gold mining that goes on is illegal. But Peru is like the number five production uh, country in the world for gold. So a lot of it is obtained illegally. And about 40% of our gold in the US comes from uh, an imported source. But the miners have no incentive to change. It's illegal, they wanna get as much gold as possible, they wanna make as much money as possible, they get the gold, get out, and they, they start a new life. Right? That's, that's their, their, their MO. The other important stakeholder is the consumer. That's you and I. So consumers have a huge effect on how the supply chain incentives work. We are pushing miners into the forest because we want the gold. We are pushing the price of gold up to $1,300 an ounce, which reinforces the idea that miners can make a lot of money. But if you just think about how much gold we use, and it's just the United States, and I want to take marriage as an example. So there's a lot of weddings in the United States. So in, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, there are about 2.2 million weddings in the United States um, last year, I guess two years ago now. And out of that 2.2 million, that's four, well, roughly 4.5 million people, about 70% uh, of those weddings involved an engagement ring that was made out of some kind of white, yellow, rose, or some kind of gold. Another 80% was made out of, uh, were wedding rings that were exchanged also made out of gold. So if you just add that up very simply, that's about 5.1 million wedding bands that are exchanged just for getting married in the United States each year. And since each wedding band roughly is about five grams, and on average, we have about 18 carats of gold in each wedding band. That's about 680,000 ounces of gold that we consume each year for wedding bands, which is equivalent to about 19.3 metric tons of gold. It's incredible, right? That's, that doesn't even account for all the other uses of gold that we have, other jewelry, electronics, anything. It's a lot of gold. We have, we have gold fever, and it, gold fever exists up and down the supply chain. Miners have it. We have it, and it's really tearing the Amazon apart as well as other tropical environments. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, there's very simple things that you can do, and I'm not gonna ask people to not buy gold. I tried that with my parents, and they looked at me like I was crazy, and I know that's very unrealistic. Um, so if my parents ever watch this, they, they know that, that I brought that conversation up. <laughs> so the, what you can do, though, is you can change the way you buy gold. The first thing you can do is you can buy recycled gold. There is a market for recycled gold, and you can buy gold products, and it doesn't matter if your gold's coming from an electronic source, an old piece of jewelry, gold is gold, and you can form it however you want. 
The second thing that you can do is you can make jewelers accountable for the type of gold that they sell. Walk into a jewelry store, ask them where their gold comes from, ask them where their mine is located, ask them how they extract the gold, and most importantly, ask them if they have a remediation plan, which means they are gonna return that gold or that land back to a natural state. And I firmly believe that if, if we can spread this message and if you can, can buy gold sustainably, that we can make a huge effect on the incentive chain up and down and how people are actually creating and obtaining and producing and consuming gold. And we can reduce the amount of deforestation that goes in the Amazon, we can preserve biodiversity, we can reduce mercury in the environment, and we can definitely make the planet a healthier place to live. Thanks.